I've never been so scared in my whole life. I pulled on my basketball uniform with shaking hands. My heart was pounding in my chest. I had never worn such open clothes before. I've hidden myself from everyone successfully for so long, but now the whole school was gonna know my secret. Hi, my name is Teresa and I'm 16. For many years in a row, I've been hiding a little secret from everyone around me. Well, more precisely, a very big secret. The size of my giant hips. I've always had a complex about them. I only wore baggy clothes and I changed when no one could see me. The whole school was preparing for the winter ball and I was no exception. Together with my mother and my younger sister, we went to the store to pick up an elegant dress for me. I was walking between the rows for a long time when I suddenly saw that very dress. It's like it chose me by itself. Grabbing it, I ran to the fitting room. And when I put it on, I realized it was perfect. But it hugged my hips really tightly. And at that moment, it seemed to me that there was nothing terrible about it because the dress was so lovely. When my sister came up, I got even more excited because she said, how beautiful. And then my mother came and she spoiled my mood. She said, it fits terribly, don't you see? We all have huge hips in our family. They should be hidden. Oh, yeah, I guess I almost forgot to tell you. Wide hips are my family's thing. My mother also wore baggy clothes, and even my little sister, even if she was only 13, was already beginning to be embarrassed by her round shape. I tried arguing with my mother, but no dice. She just criticized me and called the dress ugly, and then left to pick up something for me on her own. I didn't want to take off the dress, so I didn't exactly hurry to the fitting room. I was trying to enjoy the last seconds near the mirror, when suddenly... Oh, is that Trevor? In the reflection of the mirror, I saw my classmate looking at me intensely. I didn't know why he was looking at me, so I got scared and I hid in the fitting room. I didn't see Trevor at all again that day. My mother had picked a dress for me that I didn't like at all, but it had a big plus. My hips couldn't be seen in it. However, even this dress couldn't spoil the anticipation before the ball. I was waiting for the dance, and I still hoped that one of the guys would be inviting me. But I still couldn't get Trevor out of my head. Was he staring at me because he liked me or something? It soon turned out that I was waiting for the dance in vain. I remember standing in a circle of friends, and all of them were so beautiful. The guys all came up and invited one or the other, and it was as if they didn't even notice I was there. As if I was nothing but an empty space. And then Trevor came over. At the sight of him, my heart jumped joyfully in my chest. But as soon as he looked at me, his face twisted in disgust. He turned around and he left. And so no one had asked me to dance. Of course, I was very upset. I came home and I burst into tears. Graduation was in six months and now I wasn't even sure I wanted to show up. No one was gonna invite me and I didn't wanna go alone, like a loser. I couldn't even grieve properly because there was an important event around the corner. A basketball game with a neighboring school in which my best friend Kate participated. Even if I wasn't part of the team, I still prepared as if I was. I invented chants, drew posters. I really wanted to cheer Kate up because I went to every one of her training sessions and I was friends with the whole team. And on game day, they arrived at school and the girls changed into their clothes and went to warm up. But for some reason, Kate was late. Five minutes passed, then 10, and there was less and less time left before the match. Everyone was already beginning to seriously worry when there was a call. Kate had been coming down the stairs and had twisted her leg. She wouldn't be able to play. The entire team was literally crushed because there was no reserve player in the team. And without Kate, the team wasn't gonna be allowed on the court. There was an excited hum in the stands and everyone was really worried. And then one of the girls on the team came up with an idea. Let Teresa play instead of Kate. You've been to every training session. You know what to do. It's better than disqualification. Oh no, not that. I was scared just thinking about tight shorts. Naturally, I started denying it, but the girls resisted. So in the end, I couldn't refuse. I pulled on my uniform with shaking hands. I'd never been so nervous in my life. And finally, when I turned around, I realized that everyone in the locker room was looking at me with their mouths open in surprise. I didn't have time to understand what they were thinking. We just had to hurry to the court. The game started and, you know, to everyone's surprise, I played just fine. I always had liked basketball, so I practiced in the evenings in the backyard. I may have even tried to get into the team if I hadn't been embarrassed about the open uniform. However, at that moment, I forgot about everything in the world, even about how I looked. 
I'd been dreaming of playing real basketball for so long, and now my dream was finally coming true. The game turned out to be a very tense one. There was a draw in the last minutes. I remember how I was driving the ball and suddenly realized that victory depended on me. And at the same moment, all of my complexes attacked me. I suddenly remembered that I was running in shorts and the whole school was looking at me and, and they knew my secret. I looked around and I realized that everyone's eyes were focused on me. I ran and I threw the ball and missed. This meant we lost. I was the first one to return to the locker room. I thought the girls would scold me but they flew into the locker room after me and rushed to hug me. It turns out that our opponents had been a very strong team. In secret, the girls had been very ready to lose, and I'd never thought that victory could have been so close. And, well, the most important thing was, they liked my figure. I was shyly covering myself with a towel while the girls enthusiastically discussed me among themselves. I heard one of them even compare me to Kylie Jenner. The next day, when I was sitting in class, the principal came into the classroom and invited me to come with him. I followed him down the corridor and my heart sank into my heels with fear. This had to have been about yesterday's loss, right? Well, when we entered the office, I saw a man I didn't know. And to my surprise, he turned out to be a director of a modeling agency. Mr. Martyr was the father of one of the kids at school. He said he'd noticed me at the game yesterday and he needed girls with just my figure at the agency. I was in shock. When I came home, I thought for a long time and decided I wasn't gonna tell my mother. She would never approve of what I was gonna do, but I did decide to share it with my sister. She was completely delighted because she herself had long dreamed of becoming a model and had always been upset that nothing was gonna work out for her because of how she looked. And well, this was how my modeling career began. I went to the agency, signed a contract, and they made me up a portfolio. It was strange not to be ashamed of my own body, but everyone around me admired it and showered me with compliments, so my self-confidence grew. However, not all people understood my peculiarity. There were also some toxic people. Once, I came to the casting of a cool fashion brand and realized that I was the only curvy girl. All of the other skinny models looked at me as if I'd opened the wrong door. And just before the casting, I heard from one of the other girls. I actually know this casting director. He needs slim, not fat. She obviously hadn't said any names, but the way she was looking at me made me understand everything. I didn't belong in a place like this. I was so upset that I wanted to go home, but I remembered my little sister was waiting for me at home. She believed in me. Overcoming my anxieties, I stayed and I passed the casting with my head held high and I was cast. I was the only one out of hundreds of the most beautiful girls. Oh, how nice it was for me. The photo shoot turned out to be just awesome. The photos got into a fashion magazine and banners of me were hung all over the city. But most importantly, a big banner hung right in front of the school. Absolutely everyone saw it. Mom was upset because I hadn't told her anything. And she was also terribly surprised that someone could like how our family looked. And at school, my popularity grew rapidly. Everyone wanted to be friends with me and they asked to snap pictures. I continued to go to castings, shoot with cool photographers, and I felt more and more confident each day. So at some point, I realized I'm not going to hide myself under baggy clothing anymore. I'm going to wear exactly what I want to wear. And then there was a call from an agency that changed everything. They offered for me to participate in a local beauty contest. Of course, I just couldn't help but agree. I was preparing and waiting, but the contest was not what I expected. Again, I was completely alone among hundreds of beautiful, thin girls. And again, they looked at me with disdain, even disgust. Under the eyes of all of the other models, my confidence was melting, and it didn't matter what else I'd achieved. I walked behind the curtain. I didn't know if it was really worth participating in this at all. Maybe it was just better to go home. Why had I come here in the first place? I remember going back to put my clothes on and reaching for my high-heeled shoes before going on stage, and I saw broken glass inside. Jeez! It seemed like these girls were not gonna stop at anything just so they could win. After this, I just, I, I couldn't continue. Tears blurred my eyes as I packed my bags and I walked to the exit. I had almost left, but at the literal last moment, a miracle happened. At the entrance to the building, I ran into my mother and sister who had came to support me. And you won't believe what they were both wearing, tight jeans. My sister had always been okay with it, but my mom, 
she had always been uncomfortable all her life with her body and had worn baggy clothes to hide her hips. I can't even imagine what it had cost her to overcome herself. Looking at my proud mother and at my little sister, who was looking at me with adoration, I realized that I couldn't let them down. Despite my fear and my doubts, I returned back to the contest, and I went on stage, and I took the crown. And I realized that thanks to me, everyone in my family became a little more confident. Even my mother, who was the one who instilled her complexes onto us. And also, that nothing was impossible. Prom was also coming up. With the money that I'd earned, I was able to buy the dress that I'd loved so much six months ago, and I looked amazing in it. It was kind of funny to remember how worried I was that no one would invite me to the ball, because invitations were now pouring in from all sides. <laughs> Even Trevor showed up. Only, I never gave my consent to any of them. They didn't like me in my baggy clothes, so they didn't deserve me when I started looking awesome. And prom was the best evening of my life. My friends and I had a great time. At the very end, I was even chosen as the queen of the school. And it became clear that all of the doors that had once been closed in front of me were now open. I helped my sister to get a job in modeling too, just like she'd dreamed of. And I started my own blog to help girls like me gain self-confidence. Now, well, I think I'm ready to share the lesson that I learned. You never have to be afraid of anything. Take advantage of any opportunity that life throws you. And also, never listen to anyone else about how you look. And don't hesitate because every person is beautiful in their own way. My dreams are over. Why did it happen to us? I was lying on the bed and choking with tears. Another girl was crying behind the wall, my newborn sister. Life is going to be hard from now on. I had been looking forward to her being born so much. I wanted to braid her hair and gossip about boys, hoped we could borrow each other's cosmetics and go shopping together. But now, none of it will probably happen. Hi, my name is Emma, and I'm 17 years old. My dad works as a cashier at a burger joint in downtown Dallas, and my mom is a housewife. Our family is completely ordinary. Well, except for this. I won the genetic lottery, which surprised my mother when I was a kid. Where did I get such hair? Seeing how gorgeous it was, she allowed me not to cut it, so I never had my hair done. It grew at an incredible speed. When I was 15, it already reached the floor. Look at how lovely it was. I was proud of it, and some people envied me. I often got called Rapunzel. Well, that was nonsense. I would never let some guy climb somewhere using my hair. I almost never put it up. So that happy day, I came down to have breakfast with my hair loose as usual. At the table, my mom told me the happy news. You're going to have a little sister soon, honey. I was so happy. I immediately came up with thousands of ideas. I had seen my friends with their younger siblings teaching them to walk, talk, dress themselves. I had always wanted to have that. Now my dream was about to come true. I would post such cool photos with the baby. And if it was born with hair like mine, oh, we would definitely conquer Instagram. I shared the news with my friends at school. They were very happy and I couldn't stop smiling the whole day. But something just had to go wrong. I accidentally stepped on my hair in the school hallway, tumbled down the stairs and hit my head hard. How humiliating. But even that wasn't all that important. Jumping to my feet, I immediately looked at my hair. <sighs> It was fine. I would have never forgiven myself for ruining it. I went to a shopping center after school. I had saved up some money from lunches and decided to buy my sister, who would soon be born, a rose pink dress. When she was born and took her first steps wearing it, everyone would say, what a sweetheart, what a princess. After buying the gift, I stopped for a minute to admire my reflection in the window. But then an elderly woman came up to me. Honey, you could save people with your hair. Such curls can be sold for good money, the stranger told me. I laughed. Who said I wanted to sell my hair? Soon enough, it would make me a real celebrity. At that time, I couldn't even imagine it would really happen soon. The next day, I got a call from an unknown number. A man introduced himself as a marketer of well-known beauty brand. He told me that he'd seen a photo of my hair on Instagram and, can you imagine, offered to make me the face of their company's new line of shampoos. I couldn't believe it. Could it really be happening? After all, I was an ordinary teenager and the company offers serious money, 500 for a photo shoot. My parents allowed me to agree, and the very next day, I arrived for the first photo shoot. Makeup artists made me really pretty. Wardrobe assistants found a dress that showed off my figure, and the operator set up the lights so well that my hair shone like a Christmas tree. The filming crew showered me with compliments. I had never been so happy before. There it was, my purpose to smile and please people with my beauty. Six months flew by in such euphoria. 
There wasn't much work to do, but they really hadn't lied to me about the money. After a few shoots, I felt very rich. I gave the money I earned to my parents and, of course, didn't forget about my little sister. She was about to be born. My mother and I bought the best things in children's stores. A stroller, a crib, a bath, diapers. Everything was ready for the arrival of my new family member. All we needed was a rattle. That's what I went to buy that day. As I was waiting for the bus at the bus stop, I looked up and was so surprised I almost cried out. My photo was on a huge banner. I was holding a bottle of shampoo and smiling sweetly at passersby from the billboard. I was overcome with pride for my efforts. I put so much effort into caring for my hair, but what I saw next quickly ruined my mood. There was a small nondescript notice hanging at the bus stop. We'll buy hair for good money. All funds will go to help special children. I got terribly angry at that piece of paper. They'd even hung it next to my photo, as if mocking me. The bus arrived. There were so many people inside, I barely managed to get in. A new challenge was waiting for me on the bus. A boy about 10 years old was mumbling something about pulling my hair. I told him to stop, but the child didn't seem to hear me. He started pulling it even more painfully. In the end, I couldn't stand it any longer. That's enough! I pulled my hair out of the child's hands, acting like that with strangers was really too much. I went to the other end of the bus, but I could still hear the boy's mother apologizing to the passengers. She explained that her son had cerebral palsy. It was very hard for him to communicate with other people. At that moment, I felt awfully ashamed of myself. The boy had just been playing and I had yelled at him. I think I even blushed from embarrassment. My hair suddenly seemed to be outrageously terrible as I looked at it in the reflection of the window glass. I shouldn't have acted so badly because of it. I got off the bus at the next stop, even though it wasn't mine. A month passed since then and I still couldn't forget that boy. I felt really bad. Other than that, everything was still fine. The company where I worked grew to like me more and more and cherished me. They had even started paying me more for the shoots and hired two bodyguards for me, in case some envious woman tried to cut off my luxurious hair. All would have been lost then. They would have had to look for a new, long-haired model, and that would have been very difficult. At least until my little sister grew up. When she became an adult, she would be able to replace me on the set. The guards accompanied me everywhere, even during school breaks. However, my friends admitted that they did not like it and practically stopped hanging out with me. I can't imagine how lonely I felt, but I understood them. That was the prize of becoming a celebrity. After all, I was very close to becoming one. Soon, posters with my face would be seen in cities in other states. And after that, the company was planning on entering the international market. That's when everyone would start to recognize me on the street. But so far, only my peers did. One guy even asked me to take a selfie with him, and I agreed. Immediately after that meeting, my phone rang, and my dad told me the happy news. I finally had a little sister. When my parents brought her home, I burst into tears with happiness. The baby was so pretty. Long eyelashes, huge blue eyes, cupid bow lips. I could only imagine how many boys would fall in love with her in 15 years. We named her Chloe. I'd come up with the name. It means blooming. I like spending time with my sister so much that the shoots took a back seat. I even had to refuse their offers a couple of times. I also gave up caring for my hair. I started to gather it more and more often into a bundle. It was really getting in the way while I was taking care of the baby. But three months passed and Chloe didn't change at all. She did not babble like other babies her age, couldn't hold her head up, smile, turn over. She only cried. When my friends came to visit, they were very surprised. Their brothers and sisters knew how to laugh at three months old. Nothing changed when she was four months. Chloe helplessly threw up her hands, ignored the rattles, and it seemed even our speech. In the end, I couldn't bear it any longer and asked my mother, what's wrong with her? She's kind of weird. That's when my mother turned pale. She asked me to sit down and gently took my hand. What she said next divided my life into the before and after. Mom admitted that she had recently been to a doctor with Chloe. He had been monitoring my little sister's development since her birth, and now it had become clear to him. The girl had cerebral palsy. It's a serious disorder caused by the parts of the brain developing abnormally. People who have it can't move normally, talk, sometimes even think and perceive the world. This news made me feel like I was about to pass out. My mother tightened her grip on my hand. She explained that Chloe would be special her whole life. The damage to the nervous system couldn't be completely cured, but we could help her. She should be surrounded by special people, not only us, her family, but also a neurologist, a psychiatrist, a coordinator, a pediatrician, and other doctors. They would work with the baby so that in the future, she could live almost without any restrictions and adapt to society. But that rehabilitation was quite expensive, and we had little money. My dad was already working double shifts, and my mom? Mom would now have to be with Chloe every minute of the day. I spent the whole day crying. You can't imagine how much it hurt. I remembered the boy from the bus, who couldn't speak normally even at 10 years old. I was afraid. Afraid that my sister would be the same. I wiped away my tears and walked determinedly to the company's office. Maybe they would let me work more. I can make a lot of money and help Chloe. 
At the bus stop, I suddenly saw the poster with my photo I had been taken down. In its place now hung an ad for a dental clinic. Never mind, it didn't really matter. I would talk to my boss, and we would have photo shoots more often. But there was an unpleasant surprise waiting for me in the office. Excited, I ran to the set and saw another model there. The film crew was now paying compliments to that girl with perfect white hair and a radiant smile. While I had been spending time with my sister, the company had found a replacement for me. It hadn't been as difficult as they thought, and the contract with me had been suspended. I ran out of there and rushed to the toilet on the first floor. My heart was pounding my chest. Tears were welling up in my eyes, but I didn't cry. I looked in the mirror and suddenly realized how tired I was of my hair. Do you know what I did? I took a pair of scissors out of my school bag and cut it off. I didn't feel an ounce of doubt or sadness, along with my hair. All of my fears seemed to go away. I realized that I had needed to do it, and other people had needed me to do it too. My mom helped me sell the hair. We got good money for it, enough for Chloe's rehabilitation. The exercises were starting to give the first results. The baby had learned to hold her head up, started to babble, and got interested in toys. And just imagine, a couple of weeks later, she smiled at me for the first time. I was over the moon. I know that Chloe will always be special, but she's lucky. She has us. We will do everything to help her enjoy life. I want as many people like her as possible to make conscious steps in life to smile at their mothers, make friends, and in the future, families. That's why I've made probably the most important decision in my life. I will keep growing and selling my hair to help kids like my little sister, and I'm not afraid of losing it anymore. I was standing on a twister mat and glaring at my opponent. He clearly didn't deserve a girl like Emily. Just why did beautiful girls only fall for bad guys? I couldn't let her suffer anymore, so I did probably the most daring thing in my life. Hi, my name is Arthur, and I'm 16 years old. Guys, I bet you all know this feeling. You chase after a girl for a long time, indulge all her whims at any time of the day or night, give up your hobbies for her, and she only sees you as a good friend. The exact same thing happened to me, but I became the rare lucky guy who managed to escape the friend zone in the end. If you want to know how I did it, subscribe to our channel and listen to my story. I fell in love with Emily at first sight, as soon as she was transferred to our class. Back then, two years ago, I had made a grave mistake. I had decided to make friends with the new girl and didn't confess for too long. I'd bring her comfortable slippers to the other end of the city if she had blisters after wearing fashionable shoes. I would sneak out of the house to see her home after parties late at night, even though my parents forbade it. And when Emily had problems at school, I gave her my test answers so that she would get a good mark. But I never said a word about my feelings. That's why Emily saw all of it only as friendly gestures. Meanwhile, I was going crazy and hating myself for being indecisive. Two years had passed since then, and Emily and I were still just friends. But one day, fate gave me a chance to fix everything. Emily asked me to meet her at a cafe in the evening. I was very surprised, because she had never invited me anywhere before. Then, I thought that there was no point in putting off my confession any longer. There was my chance to tell her about my feelings. I put on my best suit, bought a large bouquet of scarlet roses, and went to the cafe. With a trembling hand, I opened the door and saw Emily. On that day, she looked especially beautiful. She was wearing a snow-white dress and had a delicate flower in her hair. I shyly walked up to her table, hiding the bouquet behind my back, when some guy suddenly came up to Emily and hugged her. I absolutely hadn't been expecting that. I froze in the middle of the cafe and was about to run away, but Emily had already noticed me. Well, there was nothing I could do but go to their table. I wished I hadn't come there at all. When Emily happily introduced me to her new boyfriend, Gregory, I wanted to sink through the floor. She kept singing him praises and smiling at him. I felt furious. I truly didn't understand how that Gregory was better than me. Things got even worse when my friend noticed the flowers I was hiding behind my back. Who were those for? She asked, curious. Hundreds of possible answers immediately ran through my mind, but for some reason I said, they are for my girlfriend. A girlfriend? I was so dumb. Emily suddenly blushed and I felt hope. What if my lie would make her jealous and help me? But I was wrong again. A few minutes later, Emily was already laughing at her boyfriend's jokes as if she had forgotten all about my words. 
and yet Emily remembered them at the end of the evening. As we were leaving, she suggested we go on a double date at her house, Emily and Gregory and my girlfriend and I. She said we would come the following day and I had no choice but to agree. But of course, I had no idea where to find a girlfriend so quickly. That's why I came home in a bad mood and spent the whole evening thinking. I had no idea what to do and was almost ready to give up when all of a sudden someone rang the doorbell. My neighbor Grace was standing in the doorway. She told me that in a few days she was going on vacation for two weeks with her parents and asked me to look after their puppy. It seemed like luck was on my side. I suggested a quid pro quo. I would convince my parents to take the puppy and she, in return, would pretend to be my girlfriend for one evening. Oddly enough, my neighbor quickly agreed to such a deal and I went to bed feeling relieved. The next morning, I stopped by Grace's house to take her dog for a walk. The pet had to get used to me for a little before staying in our house for a long time. After putting a leash on Jack, I went wandering around the neighborhood. Suddenly, I saw Gregory. I was about to say hello, but then something happened that made me freeze in place. A girl came up to Gregory and kissed him on the cheek. And they started chatting so sweetly that I couldn't believe my eyes. He had a lot of nerve to act as if he didn't have a girlfriend. And to be honest, at that moment, I felt conflicted. On one hand, I wanted to tell Emily everything right away. After all, after such news, I could have a chance with her. On the other hand, I really didn't want to hurt her. I took a photo of the couple just in case and walked home. Maybe I was wrong and there was a perfectly good explanation of what had happened. But I couldn't get rid of the unpleasant thoughts, so I came to the double date in the evening quite moody. I looked at Gregory suspiciously, but he was clearly not interested in me. He was so nice to Emily that I got even angrier. I didn't know how to make my friend look at me and started to openly flirt with Grace out of desperation. I've got to admit, <laughs> my neighbor played her role brilliantly. She constantly hugged me, whispered something in my ear, and even hand fed me cookies. We really looked like a couple in love. No one could have guessed how hard acting like that came to me. But the longer I was there, the harder it got for me to hide my anger. At one point, Gregory accidentally touched me with his elbow and I yelled at him. Because of that, Emily had to quickly come up with something to diffuse the tension. She suggested we play Twister. It could help me get closer to her, so of course, I agreed. Gregory gets a spin first and Emily, Grace, and I were on the mat. At first, my friend's plan really worked. The game calmed me down a little, and I even started to enjoy it. Especially when the moves brought me face to face with Emily. I couldn't help breaking into a smile when she looked at me. At that moment, something happened to my friend. She suddenly lost her balance and fell. That's how she became the referee of the next turn. I was determined not to lose so that I could stand on the mat with Emily again. But then, while I was crouching in an awfully uncomfortable position, I noticed something quite out of the ordinary. Gregory was checking out Grace, who had had to bend backwards to reach the red circles. I instantly felt even more livid than I had before. Was Emily so blind she didn't see the obvious? After all, her boyfriend was openly admiring another girl. But Emily was so engrossed in the spinner that she wasn't paying any attention to the playing field. You can't even imagine how hard it was for me to restrain myself at that moment. I didn't want to look at Gregory anymore and lost on purpose to become the referee for the next turn. At the time, I couldn't have imagined that would make me even angrier. After a few turns, Gregory started to cheat. I saw him deliberately stand on the circles of the wrong color to get closer to Grace. I decided to ignore it, but then something unexpected happened. Emily decided to cheat as well. It was a hard moment for her in the game, and to make it easier for herself, she put her hands on the circles of the wrong color on purpose. I wasn't the only one who saw it. Gregory did as well. He suddenly jumped to his feet and pushed Emily so that she fell onto the floor. He had gone way too far. I had never been that enraged before. What are you doing? It's just a game. I threw away the spinner and pushed him, and then I couldn't take it anymore. The emotions I had been holding back for two days finally burst out. Standing on the playing mat, I forgot about my shyness, fears, and everything else that had stopped me from confessing my feelings for so long. I didn't hold back and blurted out everything about Gregory kissing another girl, looking at Grace during the game, and my deal with my neighbor as well. But the most important thing was that I confessed to Emily in front of everyone. I told her that I had been clumsily trying to show how much I cared for her and why I had come to the cafe with a bouquet of flowers. After saying all that, I felt so relieved. The anger had disappeared somewhere and I suddenly realized what I had done. I tensed up. 
preparing for a fight in case Gregory wanted to get back at me when I suddenly heard a loud laugh. Gregory and Emily were doubled over with laughter and Grace stood in the middle of the room, confused. I didn't understand what was going on and for the first time, I didn't know what to do. But then Emily explained why they were laughing. What she told me shocked me. It turned out that Emily had feelings for me for a long time, but she couldn't understand whether they were mutual or not. After all, I had always been kind and polite, but I had never crossed friendly boundaries with her. That's why Emily had decided to set up a test and asked her cousin, Gregory, to pretend to be her boyfriend. She had hoped to make me jealous, but when I had come to the cafe with a bouquet of flowers for another girl, she had got very upset. Emily felt hurt, but had been so eager to find out why I had chosen her rival and not her that she had invited us on a double date. Seeing how well I had been getting along with Grace, Emily suggested we play Twister to be polite, but firmly decided to cut all ties with me afterwards as to not hurt her own feelings. However, the random game had ended up bringing the whole truth to light. The news put me in a stupor. I felt happy and embarrassed, but absolutely had to reach out and grab my chances at happiness this time. With an unexpectedly confident voice, I asked Emily out, and just imagine, she agreed. We spent the whole day laughing at our stupidity, and our fake dates seemed to have learned a lot from our mistakes. Gregory admitted that the girl I had seen him with had actually just been his friend. He liked Grace so much that he walked her home and asked her out on a new date. It seemed like my neighbor would have someone to miss on vacation. You've got to agree. It's a funny story. It turned out that there had been no need for me to play Emily's friend in real life. I only had to act like her boyfriend once in a game. Now, we all often get together and play Twister, which brought us happiness that day. How did you manage to get out of the friend zone? Tell us in the comments down below. Why is this happening to me? All I ever wanted was to be loved by anyone. Do I not deserve it? Hi everyone, my name is Nikki and I'm 14 years old. And it seems like my dreams about having a real family will never come true. My parents were <laughs> not very good people. They shouldn't have even been entrusted with a cat, let alone a child. But we don't choose who we're born to, do we? So, the only things I remember from my childhood are constantly feeling hungry and cold and having to hide under my bed very quickly when I heard footsteps approaching my room. Social services saved me. They promised I would have food, a lot of beautiful toys, and most importantly, no one would hurt me anymore. I happily went with them without even thinking twice. I was not gonna miss my parents, and I thought it would be, in any case, better in an orphanage than at home. The reality turned out to be a little, uh, worse. There really was food, and I shared a room with another girl my age, and we even had some toys. At first, I was honestly happy, and I even started to sleep normally again, without having nightmares or constantly waiting for footsteps behind the door. But then, I found out that things in my new world weren't as great or as fun as I thought they were gonna be. And it also turned out that you didn't have to be a villain to hurt other people. Indifference hurts just as bad. The teachers didn't notice, or I guess didn't want to notice, what was going on in the orphanage at all. The older guys took advantage of that. They took the most delicious food and things from the younger kids and forced them to do chores in their place. And if they refused, they were bullied hard and would even probably get beat up. And I learned that one the hard way. I didn't realize at first that I was just supposed to agree with everything and just do as they said. After I got locked in a toilet for disobeying them for a day, I went to the teacher and complained, but nobody cared, and the older kids got angry, and, well, long story short, it was terrible. It was the first time I ever thought that life at home might not have been that bad. I don't know what would have happened to me next if it hadn't been for one young teacher, Amanda. She was the only one who ever felt sorry for me back then. She brought me to the medical center and sat next to me the whole night, telling me fairy tales. No one had ever done that for me before. And that's how I made my first friend. Amanda and I started spending a lot of time together. Well, at least as much as we could. She protected me from the older guys and made me study and took care of me, just like a real mother would. And at night, we often climbed up on the roof of the orphanage and looked at the stars and told each other different stories. Amanda often said that I shouldn't give up. She was sure I would definitely get adopted by good people very soon, and they would love me and take care of me and do everything good parents were supposed to do. I just had to believe in it, and so I did. I believed everything she told me, and then 
a young couple who wanted to adopt a child came to our shelter. I thought they were so cool, nice and happy and well-dressed. And I decided that this was my chance for happiness. I could tell that we liked each other right away. I read them poems and I showed them my drawings and I behaved like a really good, decent girl. And they chose me. I was so happy. <laughs> and a week later, after saying goodbye to Amanda and packing my things, I was already driving towards a new, happy life in a beautiful, expensive car. It was like those fairy tales that Amanda had told me. Molly and Jack, my new mom and dad, were telling me how great we were gonna live now, laughing all the while. And then I saw their house, a real castle, and my wonderful room, and a lot of toys, and new outfits. And it was like I was Cinderella, and my fairy godmother had finally found me. I was the happiest girl in the world. My new parents and I spent a lot of time together. They helped me do my homework and took me to shopping centers and bought me everything I wanted. And they told me about different places and amazing things. And on the weekends, we always went to new and cool places. I would take a flag pin and stick it into a large map of the United States at random. And then we'd go there. I even got to see the Grand Canyon, the most amazing sight I'd ever seen in my short life. And we also went and saw water parks, museums, theaters, a real ocean. I had never even in my life dreamt of something like that. Also, we had these wonderful little traditions. Before going to bed, my mom would always come and say goodnight and read a fairy tale to me. In the mornings, my dad would drive me to school so I wouldn't have to use the school bus. We spent our evenings together in the living room and told each other how our day had gone. And it was great, really. I loved these people with my whole heart and I tried to do everything so that my new mom and dad wouldn't be disappointed in me. I helped around the house. I got up before everyone else to cook my mom's favorite breakfast. I studied well, and I always took care of my things. But after a while, I suddenly noticed that they had stopped loving me. You know, children feel things like that, even if it's hard to explain. It's just that at some point, my mother stopped saying goodnight to me. And my dad was often in a hurry to go to work, and so he started to give me money for the bus instead. And suddenly, there were no more snacks in the lunchbox to take to school anymore. In the evenings, my parents would tell me to stay at home as they went to go to a restaurant together. I hoped it was just because they worked a lot and wanted to be left alone sometimes. But the more time passed, the more scary moments like this there were. And at some point, I realized that my fairy tale was over. Now, the things that I'd been doing for them simply because I wanted to make them happy became my chores. I had to clean the whole house, cook breakfast, even wash my parents' cars. And if I wasn't managing it all in time, they harshly scolded me and would even leave me without food. They also berated me if I brought home bad grades. My life had gone from heaven to hell, and I didn't understand at all why. What did I do wrong? I'd been trying so hard, and I thought I was being a good daughter. And one day, I heard a conversation between them in my dad's office. Entirely by accident, I had been dusting next to a vent in the next room over. My mother said that she was tired of being nice and smiling at a stranger. She also said she was fed up with taking care of me and she wanted it to be just the two of them again. Children weren't fun at all, she said. <sighs> I got it. The whole time, my parents had just been playing family with me because being parents was respectable and not because they actually loved me. And now they'd had enough of playing. I didn't have anything to lose. I was already living like a servant in their house just like Cinderella from the fairy tale that Amanda had told me. So I decided I was going to run away. I packed some of my things in a bag, broke my piggy bank, and I climbed out through the window into the street at night. And why not? It's not like anyone would go looking for me. Although it wasn't much better in a big city that I hardly knew. I walked around the streets crying and I didn't know what to do. I wanted to go back to the orphanage, but no one was really in a rush to help me and the passerby that I tried asking waved me off and threatened to call the police on me. I still had no plan by the evening, so I hid in the park and decided to wait. Maybe a miracle would happen. I should have known by then that miracles just didn't happen to someone like me. If I was a character in a fairy tale, it would have been a scary fairy tale with a bad ending, because they found me. My adoptive parents suddenly jumped out of the darkness, and while I was screaming in fear, they started pushing me into a car, hissing and swearing at me. I was so scared. They looked so angry, and I didn't want to go with them at all, but I had to. They weren't exactly asking my opinion on the matter. And then there was a huge fight at home. 
they finally stopped pretending to be kind to me and shouted that I could have ruined their reputation, that I should be grateful and not bring trouble, and a whole bunch of other hurtful things. I said that they were hurting me by saying all this, and if they didn't want me, they should just return me to the orphanage since they didn't need me. To which my dad smirked and said that since I was being rude, he would have to punish me. He dragged me by the hand into the basement and locked me in there. I was left in complete darkness in the most terrible place possible. He knew exactly how to punish me because I had always said how afraid of the dark I was. It seemed like an eternity had passed before the doors had opened again. I was still lying on the top step next to the door and shaking with fear. It seemed like some shadows and evil monsters were always walking below me and that if I closed my eyes, they were going to eat me alive. I didn't even realize at first that the nightmare was over and who exactly had come and saved me. And when I saw them, <sighs> it was Amanda, my teacher. She'd seen me in the city and wanted to come up to me, but I'd run away somewhere too quickly. And then she had come to my foster family's house and pulled me out of the basement. It turned out that I'd been sitting there for almost two days, just sitting there without food or water and utterly terrified the whole time. I learned all this at the hospital where Amanda and the police ended up bringing me. I was immediately taken away from my family. Amanda took me to her place from the hospital. Of course, it was an ordinary small apartment and not a castle, but for the first time, I felt at home. Amanda helped me and took care of me, and she promised that she would never ever give me away to evil people again, and I believed her. She was the only one in my life who had never hurt or lied to me, but unfortunately, she didn't succeed. The court decided that I had to go back to the orphanage, even though Amanda and I had already done everything to ensure that I'd be allowed to stay with her. And I went back to being bullied. Only now, they also joked about how no one wanted me. And the only thing that kept me going was Amanda's tenacity. She applied for my adoption, and I prayed like I had never prayed before that things would just work out for the first time in my life. But unfortunately, my prayers, just like always, were not answered. They told Amanda that she didn't have enough money or good enough accommodations to adopt a child. I told them that money couldn't buy happiness, but that didn't seem to help at all. I still live in the orphanage. It might not be the best place in the world, and it's definitely still terrible here, but I have Amanda. I go through each terrible day just so we can meet on the roof in the evening and look at the stars and keep telling each other wonderful stories. I know that Amanda loves me like a daughter and that she's still trying to fight for me. And I believe in her, because if I didn't, then I wouldn't have anyone to believe in at all. Never again, not for anything. Summer camps are the worst invention of humankind. Well, okay, maybe not all of them, but the one I went to definitely ranks first in the top of horror places. Hi everyone, my name is Marie, and my long-awaited, magnificent, wonderful summer holidays turned into a disaster. It all began quite normally. My mom got a job as a teacher at a summer camp and decided fresh air would be good for me too. So one day she brought me with her to a camp in a forest. I imagined ordinary holidays, summer, friends, parties, some hobby clubs. So I got off the bus happy and full of hope. However, I couldn't understand where my future girlfriends were. There had been only boys about my age aside from the teachers on the bus. I'd put it down to the bus being small and thought it normal that everyone simply hadn't fit in. I only realized the scale of the disaster at the camp when there was already no way back. The news came like a bolt from the blue. It turned out it was a camp for boys, only for boys. But that was just the beginning of my problems. When we were divided into teams and led to our future rooms, I tried to be optimistic again. There were boys, I was a girl, and also the daughter of one of the teachers. So I would at least get a separate room. Not bad, I could live with it, right? Wrong. It turned out there was simply no separate room to be found for me in the whole camp. All the rooms had bunk beds and a couple of closets and were supposed to fit four people. I got three guys my age as neighbors, and for some reason, I decided that I could strike a deal with them. With a sweet smile, I suggested they live somewhere else, to be more precise. Two of them immediately pretended not to have heard me, and the third, you know, they say that love at first sight exists. I don't know about that, as it has never happened to me, but I thought I understood what hatred at first sight was. That's what I felt for my fourth neighbor called Matthew. 
while he was explaining to me in three sentences why I was wrong and where I could shove my idea. Well, at least they let me have a lower bed. Matthew even signed it with my name, in capital letters with a red marker. He said it was so that nobody would accidentally sit down and catch the arrogance virus. I felt completely lost. Hashtag, the nightmare was just beginning. From the very first day, the boys acted strange. Obviously, being the only girl in the whole camp was a big deal, but all of the boys somehow immediately began to show interest in me. It all started out pretty nice. They complimented me, helped me up the stairs, even the guys from my room were helpful. They walked out when I had to change, knocked, and smiled in the mornings. Well, all of them except for Matthew. He didn't even try to pretend to be normal and mostly insulted me. And then I started to notice that the boys, together or in turns, were trying to stay closer to me. For example, they brought me my tray of food right to my table in the dining hall. And for some reason, there was always one more cake on it than everyone else was given. Something really weird also happened at sports competitions. I rarely participated because I didn't play football or like sports much in general, but I still came to the small local stadium. There was always someone carrying my things for me, and during the marathon, everyone had to take part in. They literally carried me one by one, even though I'd said I could run by myself. Even in competitions, I was always made to sing, dance, or do something else. They were constantly looking at me, saying how wonderful I was and how great I was at everything, and they were always touching me. Someone would take my hand, then pat me on the head or give me a hug for no reason. I was tired of dodging and asking everyone to stop. At first, it all seemed fun, but then it began to scare me, and I started to spend all of my free time closer to Matthew. He was rude to me, but he was also acting normal. The last straw for me was when two boys from the next room burst into the bathroom while I was taking a shower there. They said it was an accident, but I was so scared. I immediately ran to my mom and told her everything I thought. Mom, of course, wasn't happy, but asked me to give the boys a chance. She used to tell me all the time that I was a beautiful girl, and it was normal for guys to be interested in me. And now, she just laughed, as if to say, I told you so. But she promised to deal with the troublemakers and even scolded them at the general meeting in the morning. However, that didn't stop the boys. They kept following me around, giving me sweets, and constantly offering me help. It wasn't cute at all. It was really annoying. Only Matthew remained the center of hatred in the beautiful world of guys in love with me. And then, one of the teachers decided we should spend a night in tents in the forest and do even more sports. So we were dragged to some kind of hiker trail, although it seemed more like torture to me. I tried to keep up with everyone, but I was the weakest in the group. I walked slower, carried fewer things, talked a lot, and it seemed infuriated Matthew, who was walking beside me and practicing his weird jokes with my mere existence. But I stuck close to him because by that time, the other guys were simply scaring me. Even during the hike with the teachers, they kept looking at me, smiling and complimenting me. It wasn't funny at all, especially when a couple of guys decided that carrying me was a good idea. I fought back as best I could, but I didn't understand why, and most importantly, where they were carrying me. At some point, one of them dropped me, so I fell in trying to run, but my shriek must have been heard even on the other side of the world. My right leg got caught between rocks. It was so painful. The boys immediately stepped away and pretended they hadn't done anything wrong. The most annoying thing was that Matthew came to my rescue. If only he could have just helped me and got lost, but no. While he was pulling my leg out, pressing on it, smearing something on and bandaging my poor limb, I learned so much about myself that my ears rang for hours afterwards. I was apparently the most stupid and clumsy person in the world, couldn't walk properly, only brought trouble, and so on. And then it turned out we had got lost. Completely. While we had been arguing, while Matthew had been treating my wounded leg, while my two nights without fear or brains had been laughing, our group of amateur scouts had gone off somewhere. And that was really bad news because it quickly got dark in the mountain forest and was already evening at that time. And spending the night in bad company was scary. The boys immediately volunteered to go ahead along the path and call for help and ran away. Matthew and I were so surprised by their speed we even stopped fighting. And then Matthew, making fun of and insulting me as usual, led me along the dark path back to camp while gently holding my hand. He said it was so that I wouldn't fall and hurt my neck as well. We got to the camp at night. The other boys had been sleeping in their rooms for a long time at that point already. We weren't even scolded, and Matthew was even praised for not leaving me behind. To be honest, I also felt grateful to him, but I didn't admit it. He was too nasty and mean. All I wanted to do was lie down and go to sleep. My leg hurt. I was terribly tired. I didn't even have any strength to be afraid anymore. However, I didn't get to sleep that night. For some reason, my roommates hadn't gone to bed yet. I froze before the door and listened, listened, listened. 
I'm not really in the habit of eavesdropping, but they were talking about me. The whole time I thought they liked me as a girl, as a person, and taken their actions for interest. But it turned out they hated me. They talked about how cool it was that I wasn't in the room and how much I was bothering them. They were apparently tired of listening to my whining and whims, found me useless and stupid, and thought I only ever got in the way. They said it would have been better if I'd never returned from the hiking trail because they would have had a chance to properly relax in the camp then. I heard a lot of other unpleasant things. I thought Matthew was the only one who thought that. Why were they saying such things? I ran somewhere, forgetting all about my hurt leg. I wanted to leave, get lost, never come back to the camp. But even those simple dreams didn't come true because when I was running out of the building sobbing, Matthew stopped me as if I didn't have enough troubles. Surprisingly enough, instead of making the usual jokes, he acted quite friendly, just like a couple of hours earlier. So I started crying on his shoulder, constantly asking Matthew why boys didn't like me. And then we had a normal conversation for the first time. Matthew explained to me in his usual manner that my mom had been wrong to call me a princess. Everything the guys had been doing, all the compliments, supports, even cakes in the dining room, had been done out of ordinary politeness, like holding a door or offering a seat to a stranger without any subtext. And the incident in the bathroom really had been an accident. No one had planned it. Everything would have been fine, but my own behavior made boys hate me. I acted spoiled, complained, did nothing, and demanded something from them all the time so I could only blame myself for ruining everything, even though we could have all just been friends. We talked about a lot of things, and it gradually dawned on me that Matthew was right. I was just hoping that I could still fix things. In the morning, I solemnly apologized to my neighbors and then to the rest of the boys. I spent the rest of the time at camp making up for how I'd acted earlier. It's a good thing the guys turned out to be truly good people. They understood everything and forgave me. We ended up being good friends, even exchanged numbers and promised to keep in touch. Another surprise was waiting for me near the bus that would take us home. Matthew, who kind of hated me, took me aside and admitted that he actually really liked me. It was very weird, actually, but I remembered how many times he had stood by me despite all the words he had been saying. How he hadn't left me in the forest, how he'd wiped my tears, and I decided to give him a chance. Love at first sight might not exist, but there is truly only one step from hatred to love, as we have found out. And now I know for sure. Politeness and love are completely different things. Holding the door, complimenting someone, or praising their hairstyle is politeness. And love can be different, prickly, full of grudges and jokes. But the most important thing is that it is about real actions in the end. That's how it is for Matthew and me. That was the last reaction I was expecting. Left alone, I looked down at my legs in fashionable shorts. They were so slim. Why did people still call me fat? Would they see me that way for the rest of my life? I was so hurt and sad that I simply wanted to leave the school, hide in my room and cry. All of a sudden, I felt the ground move beneath my feet. Hi everyone, my name is Penelope and I'm 16 years old. You've probably already noticed that I'm not very thin. Last year I tried to fix that, but my efforts ended in a complete failure. Do you want to hear the whole story? Then subscribe to the channel and I will tell you everything. You can't even imagine how many stupid diets from the internet I've tried. None of them worked. Sport wasn't my thing at all. One time I even dropped a barbell on the leg of a guy working out next to me in the gym. I could have probably just stopped trying to change myself, but the problem was that I really liked my classmate Reg. And he, of course, liked very fit girls who looked like Megan Fox. One day, after trying yet another unsuccessful diet, I became really depressed. I would cry after staring at myself in the mirror for a long time in the mornings, and my parents would get upset as well. Well, until something strange happened. One day, my mom put a plate of pancakes in front of me at breakfast. Creamy, delicious smelling pancakes with a ton of maple syrup. Mom, I said confused, you know I can't eat that. Your dad and I have found a solution. Now, you will become slim, just like you've always wanted. But how? I asked surprised. However, my mom wasn't planning on revealing any secrets. Just eat, and don't worry about anything. Everything will be great. I promise. She sounded so sure that I found myself unable to argue with her. Besides, I was already sick and tired of all the dietary restrictions. So I calmly ate a whole plate of my favorite pancakes and went to school. A few days later, I woke up and was stunned. I felt like my body had deflated. Ecstatic, I ran to the kitchen to hug my mom. I ate a large portion of my favorite pancakes for breakfast once again. Of course. That day, I felt quite surprised at the changes, but a week later, I couldn't recognize myself when I looked in the mirror at all. I looked slim and beautiful. 
just like all the girls in the online communities where I had found my diets. Mom, you're a miracle worker. I was overjoyed during the next breakfast. My parents just smiled in response. Maybe you could tell me what the secret is now? I asked, but my parents only shrugged. Penelope, just enjoy your new life. You are a beauty queen, said my dad, and handed me some money. Here, go buy yourself something new after school. So that was what I did. I went to the shopping center and tried on things that I had never worn before. Short dresses, skinny jeans, and shorts. After spending all the money my dad had given me on new clothes, I came back home and spent a lot of time in front of the mirror, feeling euphoric. Reg would see me the next day and be stunned. However, nothing worked out as I'd expected. Even though I walked through the school hallways with my head held high, people around me didn't seem stunned at all. A couple of girls from the other class pointed at me with their fingers and shouted mockingly, Fatty. I was so hurt that I even called my mom during a break and complained. Penelope, they're obviously jealous of you. Don't pay them any attention, said my mom. And she was right. Nobody liked it when losers became winners. It was just a pity that Reg wasn't at school that day. He would have definitely been astounded. I overheard that my crush was sick, so I decided to simply wait for his return. But what a coincidence. I didn't feel great the next few days myself. I had a headache and almost fainted in the school bathroom. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Maybe I was losing weight too fast and my body was exhausted. I even started having nightmares about waking up in my old body and being unable to do anything about it. I lived a whole week that way until Reg finally came back to school. When I saw him near his locker, I forgot all about being unwell. I confidently came up to him and said, Hi Reg, how are you feeling? But Reg just smirked and replied, Why would I talk to such a fat so? He asked, turned around, and left. That was the last reaction I was expecting. Left alone, I looked down at my legs and fashionable shorts. They were slim. Why did people still call me fat? Would they see me that way for the rest of my life? I was so hurt and sad that I simply wanted to leave the school, hide in my room and cry. All of a sudden, I felt the ground move beneath my feet. I came to in the school doctor's office. Next to me was Cameron, a guy a couple years older. What was he doing there? As soon as I opened my mouth to ask him about it, the doctor said, thank this young man. Who knows how things would have ended if it hadn't been for him. It turned out that Cameron had been walking down the hallway when I had fainted and he managed to catch me in time. But what's wrong with me? I asked, but the doctor stopped me again. Your teachers have reported that you've been feeling unwell a lot lately. You need to be examined in a hospital as soon as possible but first of all, we need to fix your diet. I was simply shocked. How had I managed to lose so much weight that I already needed to gain it back again? But there was nothing I could do. I'd read about the dangers of anorexia on the internet. That's why, from the next day, I started to eat even more of my mother's pancakes and everything high calorie to make up for the weight loss as soon as possible. I also talked to Cameron almost every day. He turned out to be an unbelievably interesting guy. We both absolutely loved playing Genshin Impact and watching Marvel movies. One day, Cameron finally decided to ask me out. We went to the cinema and he even held my hand. After that, we went for a walk in the city park. We hadn't been walking long when I suddenly started to feel sick again. I didn't faint again, but I was very worried. The next morning, I came downstairs a little earlier than usual. And here's the weird thing. I noticed that something suspicious was going on in the kitchen from afar. I hid around the corner and saw that my mother was putting something in my favorite pancakes. I couldn't believe my eyes. Still hiding from my mother, I saw that she was holding some bottle. It was bright purple. She put it back in the first aid kit, and I thought I would easily find it later because I didn't see such things anywhere else in our house. Pretending that I hadn't noticed anything, I called out to my mother. Oh dear, you're already awake. Pancakes are on the table. Eat quickly and I'll go get ready for work, she said. No, I won't eat them. As soon as my mother left the room, I opened the first aid kit, took out the purple bottle, and flushed the pancakes down the toilet. The first thing I did at school was meet Cameron and show him the medicine. Cam, can you please find out what kind of drug this is? I asked him. He was great at chemistry and biology, so he could probably do that faster than me. But I certainly didn't think he would find the answer so quickly. During the next break, Cameron pulled me aside and said, Penny, did you drink that? Well, yes, I replied hesitantly. He was nervously shaking the purple bottle in front of me and even turned a bit red with worry. Why would you do that? I've read that this is an experimental drug that has a terrible effect on the psyche. Those who take these pills stop seeing themselves as they really are and end up going crazy. I stood there and couldn't believe that it was happening for real. It turned out that I hadn't actually lost a single gram and everyone around me could see it. My perfect body only existed in my head. 
That's why the shop assistants had whispered so much, why girls at school had been bullying me, and why Reg had called me a fatso. I felt so humiliated that I couldn't even bring myself to explain everything to Cameron. Luckily, the last class was about to start, so we went to different classrooms. After school, I immediately ran home to tell my parents everything I thought about what they had done. I screamed at my mom and dad and burst into tears. Did you really think this would help me? My parents only shook their heads and said that they had meant well, that they had believed the advertisement of the dubious drug on TV. Right in the middle of our fight, I felt a familiar fainting sensation again and everything went dark. When I came to, I was on a real hospital bed. I didn't know what I was more afraid of at that moment, seeing the beautiful illusion or my real body again. But when I looked down, everything fell into place. I was fat again, even more so than before. My parents were standing next to me. Penny, we're so sorry. We really didn't mean to, said my mother with tears in her eyes. But I didn't even feel angry anymore. I was just glad I hadn't entirely lost my mind. So I told them, it's fine. After all, I'd also believed all those stupid diets would work and half of them were just as dangerous as the pills. We talked a bit more, and then they said that another visitor was waiting outside the doors. When they went out into the hallway, Cameron came in. On the one hand, I was very happy to see him, but on the other, I wanted to hide under the blanket. Cam, don't look at me. I'm ugly again, I said sadly, but he just smiled. You are the same as you were when I met you, and I like you like this. He replied and pulled out a bunch of flowers from behind his back. That's how I found out that you don't need to become a different person if your feelings are real. Cameron and I are together now. We play a lot, go to the movies, and for walks. By the way, since I started to walk more, I even lost a little weight and started to like myself more. We also filed a complaint against the companies that produce those pills, and it has been shut down. It turned out that a lot of people had suffered from that drug. Write in the comments down below. Have you ever fallen for fake products for weight loss? I would really like to read about it. I looked at my mother in surprise. A phone call? For me. In complete confusion, I went down to the first floor and it took me a moment to understand why my parents looked so angry. And when I put the phone to my ear, a joyful voice sounded in the receiver. Hello, the local news portal is in touch. We were impressed by your party. So I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Oh no. My parents weren't supposed to find out about the party I threw. Oh, what was gonna happen now? Hi, my name is Jane and I'm 16 years old. All of my life, for as long as I can remember, my family was constantly moving around because of my parents' work. Well, a couple of months ago it happened again and we came to the city where I was born. I went to school just in the last weeks before the summer holidays. And the first thing I heard when I entered the new school building was, Olivia's party was so cool. I finally my parents would let me go to her again. And for the next few days, wherever I went, I only heard about the party that Olivia threw. She was also a high schooler like me. And the more raptures I heard, the sadder I became. In the end, I couldn't even stand it, and I started complaining to my friend, Rue. But the girl only lightly shrugged her shoulders. Don't worry, Olivia's a local party queen. She gives them constantly, so you'll still have a chance to go. Rue managed to cheer me up. So the next day, I decided to get to know Olivia a little bit better, so we would hit it off. I'd already heard a lot about how nice and friendly she was but you should have seen how much her face changed as soon as I approached. Olivia looked at me with a frown and didn't answer when I tried to introduce myself. And then she turned around and demonstratively walked away. And I was left standing in complete confusion with my hand absurdly stretched out for a handshake. What was wrong with her? Her reaction seemed so absurd to me that I decided I wouldn't pay attention to it. You know, maybe she had just had a bad day. I decided to try my luck a second time at the next party. Olivia really did host them often. I remember how I came to her place, entered with the crowd, and I was stunned. Music, drinks, food, everything was just top notch. I mean, I'd never been to such a cool school party before. The next half hour flew by, and while I danced and had fun, I tried to get to know everyone properly. And then Olivia came into the room. She immediately found me in the crowd and stopped smiling. She came closer to me and grabbed my hand and dragged me out. We closed ourselves off from everyone in the room and she said angrily, How did you get in here? Who let you in? Get out of my party, now! I didn't expect that at all. I ran out of her house in tears, getting a lot of surprised looks. What had gotten into her? Did I do something wrong? Anger quickly replaced my resentment. <sighs> Never mind. I was gonna show her who she was dealing with. I would throw such a cool party that no one else in their whole lives would ever want to go to Olivia's. In full determination, I started Googling the costs of decorations and disposable dishes. But 
then there was the rub. My parents. Before inviting everyone to my place, I would totally have to ask my parents for permission, but they would never agree to anything, no matter what I offered in return. I tried to persuade them for several days until I realized there was no chance. The summer holidays were already beginning and my suffering increased dramatically. Free from classes, Olivia now threw parties even more often. And of course, no one invited me. Luckily though, after a couple of weeks, luck was on my side. My parents had announced that they wanted to go on vacation. Of course, I immediately realized that this was my chance. I said I wanted to stay at home. And as soon as they left, I immediately began to prepare a party. I got the timing right when Olivia would have no get-togethers, and I bought all sorts of different drinks, food, decorations for the backyard, and I also spent an eternity on my hair and makeup so I would really impress the guys. And at the hour the party started, I was really looking forward to meeting people, but no one came except for Rue. Looking at me with sympathy, my friend said that Olivia had somehow found out about my plans. She had hurried to arrange her own party at the exact same time, just so that no one would come to mine. Again, I was at an absolute loss. Why was she doing this to me? However, this time, I decided it was a challenge, and I would have to throw my party at any cost, one that would make Olivia jealous. The brainstorming session took several days. It was necessary to come up with something special, something interesting, and of course, I would make it a themed party associated with outdated toys. The first step was preparation. I went around to all my friends, asking to borrow their simple dimples, poppets, and spinners for a while. Once popular, these toys were no longer needed by anyone, so they gave them away without any regrets. The second step, though, was a bit creative. I made unusual garlands from spinners, and I hung them all over the house. I fastened the poppets together, and I stuck them to walls with tape so that they turned out to be iridescent and with bubbles. And then I found the coolest mattress to put up in the pool. And when I blew it up, it started to look like a giant poppet. Finally, the third step was invitations. I took this matter so seriously that no one would ever think of standing up to me again. I made personalized invitations, and I decorated them beautifully, and I even walked and scattered them in mailboxes. Now this should definitely work. No one would ever want to miss out on a party like this, at least out of politeness. And again, I began to wait with anticipation. But also again, no one but Rue came. With the most guilty look in the world, she handed me her phone. Turns out that Olivia had sent texts to all of our mutual friends. She promised that anyone who was seen at my party would never, ever get to go to hers ever again. I had <laughs> never been so upset before. I had spent so much time and effort, and only Rue, somehow, managed to cheer me up. She came into the backyard and she screamed out with admiration. She praised me and said that we had to take a lot of photos so that beauty like this just couldn't be wasted. And so we did. We swam, we ate, we drank, and we took pictures. In fact, we didn't actually have that bad of a time, but I still had a pretty nasty feeling of disappointment all evening. When I woke up the next morning, my mood was even worse. But that was only until I picked up my phone. The photos that I had taken with Rue had almost a thousand likes, and you can't even imagine how many comments there were. I scrolled through and I just, I couldn't believe my eyes. Everyone was praising me, and everyone had totally regretted that they couldn't go to such a cool, original party. But it didn't end there. Very soon, it became clear that the photos had been noticed by the city news portal, and they also commented, commending me for my originality. And after that, there was no end to my messages. Everyone was asking if I could do something like that again, and it seemed like everyone had abruptly stopped worrying about the fact that they would never be able to go to Olivia's parties again. <laughs> Finally, I felt like a winner. I didn't have time to remove the toys, so it wasn't difficult at all to arrange another party. I even started planning it when I suddenly got a message from my parents. They wrote that they'd be back a few days earlier than they'd planned. Oh, well that was a bummer. Everyone who had wrote to me had to be refused. I hurried to clean my house up from the poppets and the spinners. I even called Rue for help and she was terribly upset for me. Life, though, after my parents came home, flowed as usual. Olivia continued to throw her parties, and I continued to suffer because I wasn't invited to them. When suddenly, one day, my parents called me. There was a phone call for me. As I walked down the stairs, I didn't at first understand why mom and dad looked so angry. But as soon as I put the phone to my ear, it was some journalists. They wanted to ask a couple of questions about my cool party, and 
course, they had accidentally blabbed about everything to my parents. Oh. <laughs> I was scared. I thought I'd be, I don't know, punished and banned from leaving the house for several weeks. And so, as soon as I hung up the phone, I immediately began to explain everything to them. I told them about how nasty Olivia had been to me, and about how much effort I had put into trying to arrange these parties. And to be honest, I had almost no hope for anything. But suddenly my parents stopped looking angry. Olivia, isn't that the girl you were friends with when you were little? My mom asked in surprise. And then, when I showed them a photo of my rifle, my mom told me everything. It turns out that when I was young, I was actually friends with Olivia. However, one day I pushed her, and I had accidentally pushed her so hard that she had to be taken to the hospital and had to get stitches. After that, Olivia's mother banned us from playing together ever again. <sighs> oh my god, I didn't even remember something like that. I was way too young. But Olivia was two years older than me, and, and apparently she did. Huh. So that's why she didn't want to talk to me. Without thinking twice about it, I went straight to Olivia's house. She didn't want to let me in at first, but I was able to persuade her. I asked for her forgiveness and said that I didn't even remember pushing her, but I hadn't done it on purpose. Olivia looked at me thoughtfully for a long time, but then, to my relief, she finally smiled. She forgave me and even showed me a small scar above her eyebrow, which she'd gotten because of the incident. A little later, we started talking, and Olivia praised me for my cool idea with the outdated toys. She even said that she would have never have thought of such a brilliant thing in her life. And then I had an awesome idea. What if we united our efforts? I suggested. You have a place, and your parents allow you to organize parties. I can bring the creativity and design. And of course, Olivia agreed. I was over the moon. A few days later, Olivia and I prepared a themed party with puppets, simple dimples, and spinners. Only this time, the whole school came to the party. And it turned out to be unrealistically cool. It was so cool, in fact, that they remembered it for almost a whole year. And that's when I decided that life was finally getting better. Now I would have fun, just like everyone else on summer vacation. And I completely forgot that Olivia had graduated from high school, which meant she was leaving for college really soon. I shared my emotions with her, and you wouldn't believe what she did. At the next party, she handed the title of Queen of Parties to me. She said that I was a great organizer, and so now it would be my job to entertain people instead of her. The photos that we took at the second Simple Dimple party also got a lot of likes on social networks. So much that journalists started to try and get in contact with me again. Seeing this, my parents finally were kind to me. They said that I really had a talent for planning. And so, every couple of weeks, I would be allowed to arrange a party at my house. And this is my story. Now, if you'll excuse me, it's time for me to start hanging up the garlands. I would love to invite you, my audience, to my house, but I think there'd be way too many of you. Hi, I'm Sean and I'm 20. Look at me. Do you think I'm a good or a bad person? Do not jump to conclusions. The way someone looks can be deceptive. I didn't know what I was like until recently. But then there was one thing that put everything in its place. Subscribe to the channel while I tell you my story. Well, I studied in a college and rented an apartment. My parents lived in another state. I had a very ordinary life. We were together with Tessa and studied together. I spent evenings with friends. All my weekends I stayed in the apartment and watched TV shows or played computer games. But one day, something happened that disturbed my peaceful lifestyle. It was Sunday, as usual. I was playing Doom when I looked out the window. There was a house nearby. I spied on the neighbors sometimes over there. Suddenly, I saw a girl in the opposite window. She immediately caught my attention. The fact is that she was... changing her clothes. I immediately stopped the game and stared at her. The girl was very pretty, and I really wanted to look into her face. At some point, she turned around and... No way! It was Jillian! I packed and hid so she wouldn't see me and began to think, how could she be there? The thing is, I dated Jillian in high school. We were together for a year, but then I got bored and left her alone. She seemed very bitter about me, but I didn't feel guilty. I didn't promise her anything. I started to date another girl real soon and didn't talk to Julian until the end of school. So I went to another city. The college began. And all of a sudden, 
I see my ex in the opposite window. How could this happen? I just stared at her. Julian has changed a lot since high school. She was gorgeous. For the rest of the day, my thoughts were only about her, and sometimes I watched what she was doing in her apartment. I was sure that my ex was still upset with me, but she wouldn't like to see me, and she certainly wouldn't talk to me. So I tried very hard not to run into her on the street. It was not easy as our buildings were next to each other and the front doors faced the same street. It was not good for a while, but one day I slipped up and ran into her. Sean, is that you? She asked cheerfully. I had to admit that I was her neighbor. To my surprise, she didn't look upset at all. In fact, she seemed glad to see me. We chatted for a while and even recalled our high school time together. I was so stupid that I fell madly in love with you, she laughed. But I wasn't laughing. At that moment, I realized that I still had feelings for her, and now they had flared up again. I shouldn't have left her at school, but maybe I still have a chance? Julian left, and I couldn't stop thinking about her. I saw my girlfriend that night. I didn't tell her anything about my new neighbor. Tessa was telling me things all the night, but I didn't listen to her. I kept thinking about Julian. Hey, Sean, wh what's wrong with you? She finally asked. I lied that I had a headache and wanted to be alone. I actually felt like I didn't want to spend any more time with her, but I couldn't admit it to her yet. When I got home, I just stuck to the window and watched Julian. I liked everything about her. How she was at the computer, how she danced alone in the room, how she was having her breakfast. Of course, she didn't know I was watching her, but that made me like her even more. But one day, I made a mistake. I forgot to close the door to my apartment and didn't notice when Tessa showed up. I was watching Julian hungrily in the opposite window. Of course, my girlfriend immediately made a scene. So that's what you're doing when I'm gone? She screamed. I realized that this was the right time to leave her, so I told Tessa that it was over between us and I didn't want to see her again. She looked at me with disappointment and said, You know, Sean, you're a very bad person. You make the people around you suffer. She left, and I continued to watch Julian. Now that I was alone, I had even more confidence and thought she should have to be mine. So I started hitting on her. I was waiting for her outside the house, complimenting her and presented some expensive gifts. To do this, however, I had to borrow a large sum, but I didn't regret it because Julian deserved all of it. I started skipping class and was spending more and more time hanging out with my neighbor. Then one day, I found her chatting with another guy. It was completely unexpected because Julian hadn't said anything about him. This guy gave her a ride home and she kissed him gently. I was furious. That same night, I asked her, Hey, who gave you a ride home today? Julian replied that it was her boyfriend, Derek, and they had been together for six months. I was shattered. It turned out that I was just a friend to Julian and she didn't see me as her boyfriend at all. I was depressed for a couple of days, but then I decided it was too early to give up, and a plan immediately popped into my head. I had to make friends with this Derek and find out some nasty things about him. After all, everyone has a dark side. I found out from Julian that her boyfriend went to a gym nearby and signed up. However, I had to borrow even more money to do this, and I almost stopped going to college, but my efforts were not in vain. At one of the training sessions, I met Derek, and we became friends in the gym. Of course, he didn't know that I knew his girlfriend and wanted to win her over. We just chatted about training and sometimes sat in a cafe after the gym. After a few weeks, Derek began to think of me as his friend. After we began to trust each other a bit, I told him my most shameful secrets, hoping that he would tell me something that I could use against him. And finally, I got it. After the next training session, as usual, we went to a cafe and began to discuss the girls, and Derek said, I have a secret. Promise you tell no one. Here it is! I promised to keep it a secret and listened eagerly. Derek shared with me that when Julian was away on vacation with her parents, he was having fun with her best friend. He said her name and told where she was studying. Bingo! I did it! That evening, I went to Julian's house with a huge bouquet of flowers and confessed my feelings. To what, of course, she replied that she had a boyfriend. And then I said that Derek just didn't deserve a girl like her. I told her everything I had been told by her boyfriend. 
I told Julian the name of his friends he cheated on her with. Julian listened and was going to burst into tears, and at the end, she started crying. I knew there was something between them, she said. I tried to comfort her, but inside, I was just jubilant that everything had gone as I hoped. A couple of days later, she broke up with Derek, giving him a huge goodbye fight. I watched from my window as they were shouting and arguing, and that was what I needed. As soon as Derek left, I called Julian and invited her to a cafe. Of course, she agreed. So I started to hit on my neighbor again, comforting her after breaking up with a guy, and after a while, I finally felt like I had a chance to be her boyfriend. I was over the moon. I wasn't even bothered by the troubles in college and the large debts that needed to be paid off urgently. I was happy. Julian seemed pleased too. She wasn't crying anymore and she wasn't thinking about her ex. Once, she even decided to throw a little party to celebrate the end of a toxic relationship. She told me and invited me to her house. Come on, Sean, only my good friends are going to come. You'll like them. Of course, I agreed. I was very pleased that I also fell into the circle of her trust. What's more, I was planning on asking Julian to be my girlfriend again at this party. It was a very important evening for me, and when I went up to her apartment on the time, Julian opened the door and I got inside. Meet Sean, these are my friends, she said cheerfully. I turned around and it sent chills down my spine. Derek and Tessa were sitting in front of me. What were they doing here? Her ex-boyfriend and my ex-girlfriend looked up at me with a grin and wanted to see what I would do. I wished for the ground to swallow me up. Julian joined her guests and said, It's time to end this toxic relationship. But it's you, Sean. And here's what I've got. It turned out that after I broke up with Tessa, she met Julian to warn her about me. After a while, they became friends, and when I started asking Derek for some nasty secrets, they decided to test me. Julian's boyfriend deliberately told me a fake story, which I immediately hurried to tell his girlfriend. Naturally, they did not want to think of parting apart. They only wanted to punish me. Sean, you are a very bad person and haven't changed at all since high school. Get lost. I don't want to see you anymore, Julian told me angrily. And... I left. I've never felt so ashamed before. At first, I was angry at my neighbor and her friends, but then I realized that I only need to be angry with myself in the end. After all, they were absolutely right. I am a bad person, and now I understand it. I've been thinking about it all night. The next day, I decided I'd apologize to Julian for everything I'd done, but when I looked out the window, I didn't see her anymore. There was someone else in Julian's apartment. I found out that she had moved out of the apartment right that morning. I didn't know where I could find her now. I guess what you will write in the comments, that I am bad and deserve everything that happened to me. Yes, you're right, but I want to be good. And to begin with, I want to apologize to everyone I have hurted. I was dead on my feet and really wanted to go home, but wherever I went, I only saw unfamiliar streets. Night had fallen in the dirty, smelly alleys with broken streetlights. I couldn't see a damn thing, but they were grinning scarily as they looked at me, so I kept going forward. I'd never been so terrified in my life. Hi, my name is Linda, and I'm 16 years old. I bet you watch movies and TV series to distract yourself from real life. After all, the events on screen are much more exciting. Something happened to me not that long ago, and that story could well become the plot of a movie. But honestly, I would have preferred my life had stayed boring. It all began on Valentine's Day. Like my friends, I had been really looking forward to it. We all came to the canteen during lunch break, waiting excitedly for the Valentine's delivery guy to come. When he came up to us, each of my friends, of course, received a paper heart. Then it was my turn, and I stared at the guy with the bag full of hope. He rummaged through it for a long time, double-checked something, and then finally found a valentine for me. I pressed it to my chest, hoping with my whole heart that it was from Jack. But when I finally opened it, I realized that it was a consolation valentine from our school. It had been specially created for those who didn't get anything. It was always like that. I was always unlucky with relationships. All my friends had already managed to find boyfriends, but I, to be honest, hadn't even kissed yet. It was like I had been cursed. Boys didn't seem to like me at all, and most importantly, Jack didn't seem to like me either. 
I had been in love with him for two years. Since the moment he transferred to our school, Jack wasn't very sociable. He always had his head in the clouds and didn't hang out with many people, but I really, really liked him. That day, however, I did get lucky in the end. I came to math class when Mr. Johnson announced that our biology teacher was ill, and we would have two classes with him. He would teach both us and Jack's class at the same time. You wouldn't believe what happened next. The teacher started assigning us seats in the classroom and I got right next to Jack. I couldn't let this opportunity pass me by, so I tried to talk to him all through the lesson and get to know him better, but he didn't react at all. He replied curtly and ignored me most of the time. In the end, I got tired of being clingy. That's when I noticed that Jack was drawing some girl on the back of his notebook. I sneakily took a picture of her and in the evening at home I started googling. The mysterious girl's name was Asuka Langley Soryu, and she was one of the main characters of the Evangelion anime. She seems to just be an ordinary girl, but when I remembered how Jack had looked at her, I got an idea. A costume contest was held at our school a week later. I did everything I could to look exactly like Asuka. Unfortunately, I didn't win the contest. I only took third place, but that wasn't the important thing. After all, I achieved my most important goal. As soon as I got off the stage, Jack immediately ran up to me. He smiled, looked at me with loving eyes, and for some reason kept repeating, I finally found you. Back then, I didn't find it strange. The next day, I almost ran to school hoping to talk to Jack again. But to my surprise, I was completely ignored. It was like he had completely forgotten I existed. That's when I realized that the only way to get Jack's attention was to keep looking like Asuka. So I did. The next day, I dressed up in the red suit again. It felt like every single teacher reprimanded me. But it was worth it because Jack invited me for a walk after school. We went to a park near the school. The longer we walked, the worse I felt. Jack was acting very weird. He called me Asuka and didn't stop talking about Evangelion. And then he even started hugging me and trying to take pictures of us together. I felt awful because Jack wasn't interested in me, Linda. All he cared about was the stupid Asuka he saw in me. That's why when he tried to kiss me, still with his phone in his hands, I couldn't bear it any longer. I pushed him away and ran home. I felt so hurt I was ready to burst out crying. I'd spent so much time on that stupid costume and for what? I missed the school bus and had to take a regular one. But after a week of working on the suit, I was so tired that I passed out right then and there. When I woke up, I realized I had no idea where I was. The bus had taken me to the very edge of the city. My phone was dead, it was already dark, and I was wearing a ridiculous tight red suit that hid nothing. I didn't know what to do and just started walking forward. I wanted to ask for help but was only met with scary looks. Some guys whistled as I passed. I was so scared I ran away. As luck would have it, it started to rain. I could see everything in the dark, slipped and fell into a puddle. I was freezing and tired and scared when some dude came up to me. I felt completely lost. I just wanted to sit on the sidewalk and cry. Hey, there you are. Baby, I've been looking everywhere for you. I heard a voice behind me. I looked back in surprise and saw a guy I didn't recognize, but he was acting as if he'd known me for a long time. My girlfriend has got lost again. Can I help you with something? No? Then we are leaving. He put his arm around me and started leading me away. And the guy who tried to hit on me fell behind, apparently unprepared for such a turn of events. As soon as we were far enough, the stranger stepped away from me. He introduced himself as Dwight and apologized. He had realized I was in trouble and decided to pretend to be my boyfriend so that they would leave me alone. When I explained what had happened to me, he gave me his jacket to help me warm up. He also let me make a call from his phone and stayed with me until my parents had arrived. A few hours later, when I was already lying in my bed, I heard him calling to my dad to find out if I was alright. Dwight was my hero. He had arrived like a knight in shining armor when I really needed help. I thought I would never see him again, but to my surprise, he invited me for a walk. Wow, did he really like me? It was so strange. The boys at school didn't like me no matter what I did and no matter how I dressed. And Dwight hadn't been deterred even by me looking soaked, disheveled, and dirty. Naturally, I agreed to meet him. Jack was nothing compared to him. Dwight was cheerful, joked a lot, and constantly asked me all sorts of questions. It was clear he was really interested in me. We hung out for a few weeks and then started dating. But the thing was, unfortunately, Dwight lived on the other side of town, so we didn't get to see each other very often, but he still made me happy. At first, I found flowers on my doorstep almost every day. Then he started leaving me all sorts of nice notes. I was very happy about it all because that way, it didn't feel like we were far apart. After another week, however, I realized that Dwight was going too far. 
First I found a note in my school locker. When had he managed to get there? Was he following me? Then I felt like someone was watching me while I was walking home from school. A guy I couldn't see clearly was hiding behind trees and corners while closely following me. Didn't Dwight think that that was a little too much? In the end, I realized that I couldn't go on like that anymore. Of course I wanted to have a caring boyfriend, but such close attention made me uncomfortable. Almost scared even. I called Dwight and told him that we needed to break up. I didn't want to explain what he had done wrong, so I just hung up, even though it made me very sad. But you know, he didn't leave me alone after that. I found flowers on my doorstep again. My locker was littered with notes, and now I felt like someone was watching me even when I was in my own room. I couldn't stand it any longer. I called Dwight. Leave me alone, I shouted into the phone, but he said he didn't understand what I was talking about because he hadn't done anything wrong. And when I asked him about the flowers and notes, he was very confused. It turned out the whole time Dwight hadn't been the one behind it at all. Now I felt really scared. Some creepy obsessive fan had been following me around. The next day as I was walking home from school, I felt scared and constantly looked around. But I didn't see him until Jack suddenly jumped out from around the corner. Oscar, why are you hiding? He asked me, and something in his look seemed really frightening to me. I saw you throw away my flowers. Why did you do that, Asuka? He was moving towards me, coming closer and closer. I felt scared again. I tried to run away, but Jack roughly grabbed my arm. I don't even know how things would have ended if it hadn't been for Dwight. He came out of nowhere and saved me again by driving Jack away. It turned out he came to talk and finally figure everything out, and he was right on time. Dwight said I should tell my parents about what had been going on. I did, and they immediately contacted Jack's parents. We met, and the longer I talked, the more upset they looked. In the end, Jack's mom said, Oh no, he's at it again. A few days passed. I got out of the car and headed towards a gloomy-looking building surrounded by a high fence. I was wearing the Asuka costume, which, by that time, I'd grown to hate with my whole heart. I went up to the right floor, walked down a long corridor, and finally entered the ward. Jack was sitting in a chair, surrounded by doctors. As soon as he saw me, his face immediately lit up. Please take your pills, I told him. He nodded uncertainly and did as I told him to. One of the doctors nodded approvingly to me. It turned out that Jack was, let's call it odd. One day he had stopped seeing any difference between reality and what was happening on the screen. With great difficulty, the doctors had managed to cure him. His family had moved, but the illness had now returned. Jack didn't want to be treated, but he unquestioningly obeyed his beloved Asuka, who he believed truly existed. That's why I had agreed to help the doctors. From time to time, I would come and convince him to take pills, even though seeing Jack was hard for me. Many of you would have probably liked to live like you were in an anime or a TV series, so that life would be strange, interesting, and exciting, but you know? I think that's the way I live now, and I don't like it at all. I snuggled with my boyfriend and I shivered. We were held at gunpoint. Just one wrong move and the crowd would pounce on me. I didn't want that at all. So I straightened up and I focused on the music. The game would continue. Hello everyone, I'm Emma and I'm 16. Have you watched the Squid Game Korean drama? I bet you have. And thanks to that, I became the most popular girl in school. But I had to join that crazy game myself and pass the same tests as the characters of the series. Our game had it all. Soldiers, shootings, marbles, betrayals, massacre. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. There wasn't any massacre. But you'll have to watch yourself to find out what really happened. I wasn't used to standing out at school. And that day, as usual, I comfortably settled at the back desk, stacking my textbooks and preparing to take a nap when suddenly our principal came into the classroom and I didn't feel so sleepy anymore, especially when I heard the news. Guys, it's time to choose the school's president. This year, we decided to decline the usual format of elections with noisy campaigns, slogans, and public debates. And whichever one of you is worthy of becoming a leader, you'll have to decide for yourself in any way convenient. In one week, I'm going to be waiting for the new president of the school in my office. Everyone around seemed like they'd gone crazy. They were literally suggesting anything. Secret ballots, drawing straws, running races, setting a rap battle. But none of these ideas satisfied a majority. And that's when I heard my old rival's voice, Stella. What if we arrange our own squid game with the same tests as were shown in the series? It was one of those awful silences in the classroom. I saw the scared students' faces. They were obviously frightened. The silence was thankfully interrupted by my boyfriend, Joseph. Are you serious? And what are you suggesting? Oh, 
it's very simple. Those who don't want to participate become the staff, and they'll monitor compliance with the rules. And those who've dropped out will grant wishes, no matter how crazy or shameful they might be. You probably won't believe it, but Stella's idea actually worked. Students' hands went up one by one in agreement with her. I looked at Joseph in confusion. To be honest, I was a huge coward. So I wouldn't have agreed to do that for anything in the world. But I saw my boyfriend vote yes. And after him, I raised my hand with uncertainty. There was no turning back now. The game was beginning. After classes, we all gathered at a playground near the school to discuss the rules. Stella was so inspired by her idea that she just couldn't shut up. I propose we hold the first game tomorrow after classes. So, how many of us are there? Mm, one, two, three. 15 participants and 20 for the staff. For authenticity's sake, we need to come up with an outfit, just like they have in the series. Let's do this. The players will wear green track suits, and the soldiers can wear pink clothes and masks. You can buy them, or you can make them yourselves. And now, we just need to distribute the numbers. I put my hand into the drawing cap, and I took out a piece of paper and held my breath. Please, at least a lucky number seven. But the bad news was just waiting to disappoint me. The number that came up was 13, a common symbol for hopelessness and bad luck. No wonder I went home in a terrible mood. But things the next day got even worse. When the last class was over, Everyone gathered on the playground behind the school. Of course, I knew what was waiting for us. The first and the craziest round of the game, red light, green light. Fortunately, the scary doll, just like in the series, was not on the set. And I breathed a sigh of relief. But suddenly, a crowd of students in masks and pink suits appeared from behind the trees. Every one of them held a paintball marker in their hands. I clung to Joseph's arm with a death grip. I was never so scared before. The people in pink surrounded us and they gave us a start. A pleasant melody was played from the speaker and Joseph and I rushed forward when suddenly the music stopped and a loud clapping came to replace it. I gripped my teeth and I squeezed my eyes shut. And when I opened my eyes, I saw my classmates lying around me. They were splattered with paint and thus they had dropped out of the competition for the title of school president. I didn't want to suffer the same fate, but when Joseph and I had almost reached the finish line, the music suddenly stopped. I couldn't slow down in time and I waved my arms to keep my balance. No, no, this was gonna be the end. I was so sure I'd get shot by paint when suddenly the speaker started playing music again. Joseph and I took our few last steps and we found ourselves behind the finish line. Wow, unlucky number 13 had actually saved me. After all, no one had noticed my misstep. The losing students afterward were kicked out of the game and only 10 people remained. I returned home happy. I mean, after all, I was a devoted fan of the series. I knew exactly what to expect in the next round. The game called Sugar Honeycombs. I made Dalgona out of sugar and baking soda, and when they froze, I armed myself with a needle and I began to rehearse. Just like the main character of the squid game, I started to lick the candy, and I soon easily picked out that wretched triangle with the needle. Therefore, I was 100% ready for the next game. And after classes, we gathered again on the playgrounds. Suddenly though, instead of sweets, I saw sheets of paper laid out for hopscotch. Ah, oh, no way! They were cheating, violating the order of the cereal rounds. And now we had to deal with the glass bridge, the one that took so many lives in the drama. I reached into that same hat again, and I pulled out another piece of paper. Please, at least let me be lucky now. With trembling hands, I unfolded the paper, and there it was, salvation. I was ninth. Of course, everything was not the same as in the series. When the guys made a mistake with the choice to sell, they read a wish made on the back of the sheet. They were out of the game, but at all costs, they had to fulfill everything that was written there. And in front of me, one by one, participants left the game. I memorized the safe cells and I followed behind in their footsteps. And only when the paper hopscotch was left behind, I realized what my luck had saved me from. Those losers were eating cockroaches, climbing tall trees and sending their most shameful photos into public chats. I think I would die of shame if I had ever received any of those. But my 13th number didn't let me down again. And I ended up in the lucky number four. Me, Joseph, Stella, and Dan made it all to the next round. But I didn't know what I would have to do there. The next morning, I went into the classroom when suddenly I met the defiant eyes of everyone in the class who were angry that they had lost during the tests. I clung to Joseph and I was afraid to look up. It seemed like everyone around me hated me. But the class ended and we were back on the playground. 
A new fight was waiting for us, the final round, and it was the marbles game. According to the series, I remembered that only one of the two would remain, so I didn't choose Joseph as my couple. Stella came up to me, and we decided to play tic-tac-toe. We drew cells on the ground, and we held our breath. We throw marbles into the occupying cells. The one forming a line of three wins. It took all of my power, but I still saw Stella's marbles lined up in a frightening row. She just needed one more throw and she would win. I squeezed the marbles, I took aim, and I broke the opponent's line. After just a few minutes, my marbles filled the three cells in a row, and I won. I won! I had already collected them all in a bag when Stella suddenly said, Amy, I saw you move in the first game. So if you don't give in now, I'm gonna tell the staff everything. Then they'll review the video, and you'll have to fulfill all the wishes that the losers of the previous round did. My mouth dropped open in surprise, but I quickly pulled myself together and I rushed forward with the bag. I was running, and I was hoping for a miracle, when suddenly I heard a loud scream behind me. It was Stella. Uh, my leg! Stella had run after me, but she'd fallen, it seemed, and injured her leg. Yeah, I wanted to win, but I didn't want to win like this. After my opponent was taken away by an ambulance, things got weird and scary. The guy who'd lost to Joseph didn't want to hand over his phone and started a fight. I was so frightened that I ran home, but it didn't get any better there. I was tormented by Stella's words. So just under an hour later, I decided I would visit my rival. Stella, take my iPhone. Let's just say that I lost the test. Just please don't tell anyone about it. Put it away. I don't need anything from you. I'll keep quiet anyway. Don't worry. Oh, oh, okay. Well, now nothing was threatening my victory. Joseph and I got to the final test and he promised he would lose to me. I was sure that the next day I would become the president. So I came to school as happy as ever, but my mood was hopelessly spoiled. Being in our classroom had become un unbearable. Students were gossiping about each other, calling each other names, and they were divided into small groups. It was so good that I had Joseph. Otherwise, I think I would have just gone crazy. Classes flew by, and Joseph and I met on the chalked squid, and I had the role of a defender. He had the role of an attacker. We were surrounded by a crowd of classmates, but I wasn't scared. I knew that this whole game was just a formality, and they called the start. I prepared to fake like I was trying to do something when suddenly Joseph jumped up and pushed me sharply. I fell, tearing something in my knee. Joseph had way overdone it. Maybe I shouldn't have played so naively. My boyfriend bent over me and I stretched out my hand, thinking he was gonna help me get up. But instead of helping, he whispered in my ear, sorry honey, it's every man for himself. And at that moment, the crowd seemed to go crazy. Joseph, 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 come on, get rid of her. I, I, I felt like I was ready to cry, but I didn't want to do anything that would please my now ex-boyfriend. This game had gone too far. I got up, took my number off, and I tore it to shreds. Guys, look what you've become. Are you really ready to risk disgrace, suffering, betrayal, all because of some stupid game? If it's really necessary to sacrifice my conscience for the sake of victory, then I don't want to claim to the position of school president. Well, what are you waiting for? Congratulate your champion for his horrible conduct and his treachery. I went home. And oddly enough, my desire to burst into tears had gone. I felt good. Along with those words, I felt like I'd gotten a lot of negativity out. And I finally felt free. After all, I now no longer had to be afraid of payback for defeat. It only remained to fix what this game had done to us. That very same evening, I brought some treats and I visited Stella. And you can imagine, she was very happy to see me because I was the only one who was worried about her health. We chatted for hours and in the end, I left her as a friend. What a pity it was that she was in a hospital bed. Stella's support would have been so useful right now, but I had to go and fight this alone. The next morning at school, I made the most indifferent look when suddenly I was surrounded by students. I tensed up and I got ready to defend myself, but one of them said, Emma, we talked to each other and we decided we don't need a sneaky president like Joseph. We choose you. Please take the presidential position. I couldn't believe it. Did my speech yesterday really wake up the students' consciences? Yeah, this squid game had ended really unpredictably. I thought about the offer for a long time and I agreed. And that's how I became the president of the school. And by my first decree, I banned violent games. Let them remain only on your screens. 
You might ask, what happened to Joseph? Well, his parents took him to another state and hopefully we will never see each other again. What kind of games did you like growing up? Tell us in the comments. This is the SCP Foundation, a secret organization that finds and studies anomalous objects all over the planet. These are the Foundation's secret files. You may already be familiar with them. And these are the stories of ordinary people who got lucky to encounter the most horrifying creatures in the world. The SCP Chronicles reveal new details about the anomalous objects you didn't know before.